So I think probably what we'll do then is we'll, we'll kick off. Um, as I always say, um, in these times when there is so little that you can control, one of the things you can control is, um, is your timekeeping. So we, uh, we're going to start off now and, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining Nadia and I today uh, on this uh, webinar to discuss unle unleashing the silent potential of, of your workforce. Now, you might say, why is an innovation company uh, talking about shyness? So um, for those of you who don't know particularly well, my name is Mock O'Keefe and I'm the founder of the Innovation Beehive, which helps organizations innovate new products, services, experience, new employee experiences, work on employee culture and help leaders lead through disruptive times. It may not naturally be a bedfellow to be talking about a diversity, about inclusion and about shyness as part of that diversity and inclusion agenda. But as an innovator, diversity is really, really important for us. One of the things that we seek in our projects is to uncover hidden insights, to look for unexpressed or unknown needs, pains, desires of our customers or internally in the organization of the employees. And so making sure you're talking to a diverse population and a diverse stakeholder group is vitally important. This makes sure that you are understanding really what's going on in your chosen marketplace or in your organization. So you can create an innovation, a product, a service or experience that's going to attract the best possible price, the best possible value for the end user. And so particularly at the moment, we've been thinking about uh, as we're all in lockdown and talk about potentially coming out of lockdown in a couple of weeks, but we know certainly for the time being that we're all having to, well, most of us are having to work remotely. It's more and more difficult potentially with these new technologies for everyone to have their voice heard. Leaders need to be reminded that there is potentially a, a, a population out there who aren't naturally uh, coming forward, who might be a bit quieter, who might be a bit shyer. shyer. Um, and the remote working world might be a difficult place for shy people to navigate. So that's why we're talking about it. Nadia and I, and I'll ask Nadia to introduce herself in just a moment. Nadia and I have worked together for a number of years. We originally started working in an innovation agency um, in London many years ago, more years than I care to say, but before dogs, husbands and children arrived for both of us. Um, and, uh, and, and over the years, I've watched Nadia really focus on, on helping people think differently and exploit their true potential, particularly now as the psychologist, thinking about how people who are naturally shy can make sure that their voice is heard. And for organizations, as you will hear, who are really focused on diversity and inclusion, on listening to their employees, listening to their customers, and making sure they're getting the best possible insights to innovate, I think particularly during these remote times of lockdown, the, the, the shy agenda is more important than ever. So I'm going to now be quiet, if I can, <laughs> for as much time as possible and hard, hand over to Nadia Finer, who's going to explain a little bit around her background and then take us through the majority of the rest of the programme. Okay, well, thank you, Mark. Thank you for inviting me and for having me um, here today. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about my my sort of background, my story, if you like. Um, uh, I'm Nadia, like I said, and um, I know what it's like um, to be shy, to struggle with shyness. So that's why I'm here. Um, and I wanted to kind of give you the history, if you like, of, of how it all began um, for me. So I remember the day that my shyness kind of took over my life, if you like. Um, I was 14, um, I was at school and I was in a French lesson and um, it was a number of years ago, um, like Mock said, <laughs> more years than I care to remember. But to put it into context, we had a new language laboratory and um, there were tape machines, so it's quite a while ago. And um, we had to put the big headphones on and record ourselves speaking um, in French and then hit record, um, hit play and listen back to what we'd said. 
Now, I loved French. It was my favourite subject. I kind of imagined myself being a chic Parisian, um, sipping espresso in a corner cafe full of, uh, you know, intellectuals. <laughs> That's kind of where I was going with it. But when I hit play, um, the voice I heard talking back at me was it was a very strange experience because the voice I heard was that of a, a, a kid, a tiny kid talking, saying exactly what I had said, but not in a voice that I recognised. And at first I was really confused. I couldn't understand how some, I literally thought, how has someone else said exactly what I've just said? Um, and then my brain kind of, um, joined the, the the synapses I suppose all the connections together and I realized it dawned on me in that moment um that that voice the little voice that I heard that sounded like a tiny kid was me um and in that moment everything changed for me because up until then I didn't know that was how I sounded I'd merrily gone, gone along with my life, never recording myself or hearing myself speak. And I know we all sound different to the way um, we think we sound, but for me, it was a, a real shock. And I made a kind of a big decision, which I didn't tell anybody about. Um, I made a big limiting decision right there. Um, on that sort of Tuesday at 2 p.m., I decided that because I sounded so little, which was weird, um, I would keep myself very quiet and live in the background um, of my own life. And so what this meant was that never again would I phone somebody I didn't know. Um, I wouldn't go on the stage or be in any kind of performances. Um, I would never leave voicemail messages ever again. Um, I wouldn't um, speak up in front of a group or present my work um, in front of people I didn't feel really, really comfortable with. So you can see how um, on that day in the language lab, my life kind of shrunk and shyness took over. And I know that rationally it's not a really big deal. And to many people they'll say, oh, you sound fine, what are you on about? But over the years, um, I have been sent off by various teachers or employers to elocution lessons, kind of against my will, but I just sort of went along with it because um, I didn't want to make a scene. I've had to lie on the floor and breathe through my belly like Colin Firth in the King's Speech, which was a bit strange. Um, and I have people come up to me in the street or in restaurants or in hairdressers and make comments about my voice and tell me that I should be um, a cartoon voiceover person or um, that I should be on like some kind of dodgy phone line. <laughs> um, so you can imagine that professionally um, it's uh, impacted me as well as personally. And, um, it's made me feel really shy and worry that people won't take me seriously. Um, it's caused me in a work um, situation, it's caused me to create things and then shy away from promoting them. Um, I've kept my opinions to myself and not spoken up in meetings. Um, I've avoided opportunities like um, perhaps giving a talk or a presentation. Um, and in general, I'd say I've avoided pushing myself forwards and I felt like I'm not quite cut out for success because when I see successful people, they're not like me. Um, and yet I'm here today talking to you about this topic of shyness. And um, the thing with shyness is we don't hear from shy people very often um, because we're hiding or lurking in the background. And so I think as a result of that, you tend to only hear from people who are quite loud and um, willing to put themselves forward. They're more confident, perhaps. And so, yeah, because these attributes don't resonate with us, it's a vicious circle and we continue to hide. Um, and so you don't hear from us. So that's why I'm on this mission really, to take action and to try to do my bit for shy people to represent us and be a kind of champion for us, if you like, because um, 
nowadays I do feel able to make um, to give presentations and talk in front of people I've learned to handle it and to take steps forward so I can be here and talk about this subject okay I get really nervous but I can do it and so yes that's why I'm here today and we're going to talk about shyness in general and we're going to talk about what you guys can do in your organisations to hopefully help um, your shy people to shine. So first of all, um, I have a question. Talk. Yeah, we have a question, don't we, um, for the audience. So I'd like you to answer what percentage of the UK population do you can do you believe considers themselves to be shy? And you can answer the poll. We've gone all interactive, so you can choose whether you think it's seven, twenty-seven, forty-seven, or sixty-seven percent. So everybody get involved. We can see the numbers coming in now. We'll reveal them shortly. Oh, it's like X Factor. Exactly. <laughs> haven't got the music. Yeah, no singing. That's definitely something I'm never going to do. <laughs> so I think we've had most people vote now. So okay. now I will share the poll online and you'll then be able to discuss the results with our delegates. Okay, so it's come out that the majority of you guys think that 27% of the population considers themselves to be shy. Well, in fact, um, although we don't talk about shyness very often, you'll be surprised to hear that 47% of the British population consider themselves to be shy, but 10% um, of the population considers themselves to be very shy. So you can see how nearly half of us have shy tendencies um, and then 10% of us are very shy. And in the younger people, in people who are 16 to 24, 17% of them consider themselves to be very shy. So that raises all kinds of questions, doesn't it, about whether shyness is actually on the increase, whether there's things like social media um, and technology, maybe Instagram would be a big culprit, perhaps that are making young people feel even more shy um, than uh, people were traditionally. Um, so to date, let's go on to the next slide, shall we? Um, okay, yes, this one. So we don't really talk about shyness, but as I've mentioned, 47% of the British population are shy. And so it seems to me that if 47% of us are shy, how big's the silent potential in your organisation? The discussion to date around diversity and inclusion has focused on demographics, things like gender and skin colour, education, social mobility. But what about the way we think, our behavioural preferences? Um, in order to solve the trickiest problems and get to the best ideas, um, organisations need a mixture of personalities, a mixture of preferences. They need cognitive diversity in order to function and succeed at the highest level, particularly in challenging times like these. I think that diversity is about making sure everybody is represented and everybody is heard. And yet the quietest voices are often ignored. Like we see here, 47% of the population are shy and 10% are very shy. And if shy people are not comfortable speaking up, then they're silent and that can lead to them being underestimated or overlooked. They probably shy away from things like networking, presenting, speaking in meetings um, or even pu like public speaking they might find it hard to butt in in a conversation perhaps in a meeting where everyone's talking over each other <clears throat> they find it hard to big themselves up to share their ideas to say yes to opportunities and call out when something's wrong um, and all their ideas and insights stay hidden that's the silent potential in your organization 
and that silent potential could be costing you millions um, it seems to me that you could be missing out on a lot of the good stuff if every time you run a meeting say 10 percent of your people might be silent and every time you run a brainstorm 10 percent of the ideas might not be shared and every time you face a challenge in your organization 10 percent of the solutions might remain secret or silent and i think it could just be that it's not even any 10 percent it could be the best 10 percent um, because shy people are actually, um, I think, um, shy people, it's not just, shyness is not just a problem or something to be fixed. We have superpowers. Okay, we'll come on to those in a minute. So I want to know from you guys how shy you are. And we have another poll here. Um, right. Let me send Lawrence the poll. With some questions, drum roll, please. I want to find out whether you guys fit into any of these categories and how you feel about shyness, whether you're not shy at all, a little bit shy in certain situations, shy to the point where it holds you back, or maybe you have um, social anxiety, which is a really extreme form of shyness. The boats are coming in. Yeah, I love these poles, they're so fun. Okay. Right. So you can see, obviously, this is not a cross section of the population because we're talking about shyness. So you've kind of self-selected by being here. But 85% of you are a little bit shy in certain situations and 8% of you are shy to the point where it holds you back. So you can see how um, being a little bit shy in certain situations is something that a lot of us experience. Um, shyness affects us in different ways at different times when we're doing different things and it's I find it fascinating because it's not the same experience for everybody um, so some people will be shy like I said on the phone or giving a talk whereas um, other people are shy perhaps in a, a party or even with their friends um, with their families and it can come and go in different ways so it's a it's a really fascinating subject and I, I'm really enjoying kind of digging into it and understanding more about it. Um, but let's come on to the next slide because I mentioned that I think shy people have superpowers and this is something which um, is a little bit more controversial because um, we tend to say to people stop being so shy or don't be shy, you know, come on, don't be shy. People say that to me all the time but shyness is potentially part of who we are it's our personality it's our, it's the way we behave the way we think and there's an upside to it i believe that shy people don't need fixing we're not broken and that we do have these special skills skills like and these these are kind of coming about because we're not always talking and we take a step back and we're observing, we have world-class listening skills, we make measured, considered decisions because we have a really strong internal dialogue where we're thinking about things for a while before we speak out loud. Um, shy people have an attitude for uncovering key insights and this is really important, particularly in innovation. We have creative brains full of ideas um, the challenge is just getting us to um, communicate those ideas. We have high le levels of concentration um, and the potential, I believe, to become really strong leaders in complex situations. Shy people are often motivated by purpose and quality, not by ambition, which is interesting, I think, given perhaps um, the nature of many of the leaders in the world today um, i wonder what the situation would be globally now if more of our leaders were motivated by purpose and quality rather than ambition um, and shy people have a talent for building meaningful connections and relationships we might not have the biggest number of connections or be the most well networked but the people we do connect with, um, we know on a deeper level, we get to um, 
we listen to what people have to say and we form deeper relationships. Quiet people will often give you breakthroughs um, in your business, but without the psychological safety, without the support um, that they need um, to feel comfortable, they won't contribute. And I think that now more than ever, we need shy people to speak up because of everything that's going on in the world. Um, we need to hear their ideas and insights. We need to understand what their solutions to problems might be. So it's really important that we learn how to um, support shy people so that they can shine, um, even in a very noisy, challenging world. Right, let's go on to the next slide. Okay. So we're going to talk about what leaders can do to unleash the silent potential in your organisation. Um, but before, um, oh, go back a bit, Michael, <laughs> just wanted to say something. Before I go on to the next bit, I want you to think about the fact that um, when shy people don't speak up, brilliant ideas and thoughts are lost. Not, they're not only not fulfilling their potential, but your organisation is missing out. Um, so have a think about the fact that, um, say, in healthcare, imagine in surgery, for example, you have a situation where you have a very dominant surgeon in charge, and then you have a team of people, and perhaps a couple of those people in the room are shy, and something's going wrong, and they don't feel able to contribute or speak up. Well, it turns out, according to research, that in health a failure to speak up is an important contributing factor in communication errors. Now imagine um, aeroplanes. It turns out that plane crashes are often caused when co-pilots don't speak up, when they don't feel able to perhaps question the captain's judgment or share something that they're worried about or that's going wrong. And there's been story after story of planes going down and people actually dying because someone who's a little bit shy was unable to voice their opinion. Um, it seems that in complex situations, um, this dominance dynamic doesn't work. It makes it harder for people to make to, to be heard. And um, when you have a range of voices and perspectives and um, you maximize your collective intelligence so this is really important um, and it surprises me actually that people haven't really talked about this very much before okay so now we're going to talk about what you can do and we're going to do a um a little exercise aren't we Michael, do you want to talk us through this? Yes, so I'm going to actually probably ask my colleague Joe to come and help us as well. So, uh, Joe, do you want to come and say hello to everyone? Hello. <laughs> so, um, thinking about what Nadia has explained of her, her personal journey, and, and we've had a lot of comments in the, in, the in the comment box, Nadia, people who are really enjoying it, really appreciate you sharing your journey, oh. your insights, which is lovely already. Thinking about what Nadia said around the, the, what we're missing out in terms of potential. Um, we were just wondering before we go into some some best practices that Nadia and I have seen. Are there any examples or that you've seen in your organisation where leaders have consciously sought to unleash the silent potential in their organisation, or do you have any ideas what leaders could do? And we want to try and make this a little bit interactive. So we're going to move to our whiteboard functionality, which Joe's going to help us with. And um, if you want to share anything in the comments, uh, we can then transfer them on the whiteboard and we can then see, using the wisdom of the crowd collectively, anything we've observed to um, encourage the silent potential of the organisation or any ideas that we have about what leaders could do to unleash the silent potential in their organisation. So a bit of innovation and idea generating. Ah, so we've got one here from Anthony saying um, an anonymous box for ideas yeah absolutely so because people uh, contribute through different medium not having to speak up but being able to write your idea might be something Nadia, as we go along any comments or bills would be fantastic 
Yeah, I really like the kind of anonymous um, thing. Being Feeling like you're not being judged is really important and giving people the ability to contribute, not necessarily having to speak up in front of everybody um, is a great thing. <laughs> And we've got from Jo Marie here, I'm um, using time to think mythology or, or a talking stick. Gosh, yes, absolutely, when you have the talking stick. I know when I make presentations, believe it or not, those who know me, I'm actually quite shy. Um, and I hold onto a pen as my kind of comfort and my talking stick. Um, we've got one from Jane here. My manager makes sure they give space for every person in a meeting and invites everyone to speak. Nadia, what are your thoughts about being being actually invited in to speak in the organisation because people can have different um, opinions on that. Yeah, but I think people have different views on that and it depends on the person. So for some people, you just need the time and the space given to you to speak. Um, I find that's okay. Um, for other people, that would be kind of, that would feel like they're being put on the spot and might completely freak them out. So um, I think it's the responsibility of the manager to, to kind of be, and we'll come on to this, to be aware of what's going on and get a sense that whether putting someone on the spot in that way or done gently, it could feel manageable, but for some more sort of extremely shy people, that might be quite a scary thing. Um, oh, look, we've got loads of comments coming in, haven't we? Yeah, we've got Jane uh, sharing her experience here about how when she, she was told that she wasn't who they expected to employ. Uh, so what you're saying really resonates, Navi. I'm sorry you experienced that, mm. Jane. What, a, you know, what potential are they missing out in the organisation? Um, it's interesting, actually, that often um, leaders seem to recruit in their own um, image. And you can end up with a situation where you have a really kind of extrovert loud type of dominant um leader who fills a team with people who are similar to them and you end up with this situation where everybody's fighting for airspace and talking over each other nobody's listening you need a mixture of skills a mixture of preferences and behaviors to get um to get the best results if everyone's um, just noisy otherwise, chaotic and noisy. And I think... That preference and idea, Zach talks about using any psychometric profiles to understand people's thinking preferences, things like, well, our own innovators profile on the Innovation mm -hmm. Beehive or HBDI, Insights, DISC, MBTI, various profiles which will help you understand people's thinking styles. Have you any experience of those and any comments on, on psychological profiles? Yeah, I think they can be really um, a good thing done in the right way. Um, but also just getting to know people on a personal level and understanding what's going on for them. We'll come and we'll talk a bit more about that in a while. Um, listening to people <laughs> and being aware. Um, oh yeah, here we go. Asking a shy person for their thoughts and ideas, follow up the next day. Yes, they will have had a, more of an internal dialogue. Yes. And Nick's talked here about actually giving specific quiet time to think about a subject to be discussed at the start of the meeting. So calling out, actually, yes, we're going to have some specific time here. What are your thoughts about making everyone be in silent, giving time for reflection? There's not enough quiet time. <laughs> It seems to me we go into we go into meetings and everyone just starts talking immediately when actually um, I know that I think it's Amazon does this where they do um, a reflection at the beginning of a meeting and that really encourages people to have thought through um, what they're going to say and it, it moves us away from speaking for the sake of it and puts people on a more even level. A couple of people, Catherine and Jo Marie, have talked about letting people know in advance what's topics. That, that might play into that quite well, wouldn't it? Yeah, shy people do a lot of deeper thinking. We like to be prepared. So um, if we know what's coming up, it, it reduces the feelings of being put on the spot um, because we've done, our, well, we've done our homework and we're ready. And we perhaps have some notes with structured points that we can follow. So even if we're nervous speaking up, we, um, we're not going to lose our thread or get all kind of wibbly um, in a pressured situation because we've thought it through. And actually, 
Um, although this kind of stuff helps shy people, don't you think it's better for the world and the business in general if people are thinking through what they're saying um, and they've thought about stuff beforehand? Um, I think you get better quality. Well, we're getting loads of ideas and insights oh, coming. We'll, in, in the interest of time, because we've been half an hour already, what we'll do is we'll make sure we record the chat um, yeah. and we'll shave the whiteboard and we'll send this out to everyone with a recording after the session. I don't yeah. want to lose the nuggets that I know from our conversations to paying for this are about to come. So, yeah, let's keep going and then we can share more stuff onto the whiteboard. Okay, so let's come on to the first thing. So the first point I'd like to make is about awareness. Um, I would really like to see more discussion of shyness in the workplace. Um, events, talks, you know, the kind of thing that I do in organisations where I go in and do a talk um, and bring the subject of shyness out of the shadows. Um, running stuff like workshops or even having your very own Shine Mighty Society in an organisation where people can go um, and be part of something and the shyness is part of the discussion, it's on the agenda. Um, in terms of, in, on an individual level, I think looking out for shyness, just being aware that it's a thing, that it's a thing that lots of us um, are have as part of our personalities and I um, mean you know the number of I've had some quite upsetting conversations with people over the years not just about me but about um, other shy people where um, managers have said oh this you know this person's so frustrating they don't you know I ask them to do something and they just don't do it I don't understand why they don't just phone up this person I keep asking them to do it and they keep sending emails instead or they keep avoiding the thing um so being aware of shyness you start to understand that maybe there's a barrier that somebody's facing which to you is unimaginable you don't get it you don't see why they might have an issue with that thing um and just having it on your radar so you can do something about it. And um, we shouldn't be trying to change people's personalities or wishing that they were different. But what we can do is, is make a choice to nurture and support people and help them build on their skills and their strengths. You know, we talked about the superpowers. Um, it may be that someone who is shy is not great at networking at conferences. But what they might be really good at is interviewing people for your podcast. Um, it may be that they're not really comfortable giving talks in front of um, enormous audiences, but what they are really good is, fac uh, is facilitating focus groups. So you start to see how people's strengths, their listening, their um, observing, etc., can be a strength. It's not just something to be frustrated or annoyed about. Um, so yeah, the first thing I'd love everyone to do is just be aware of shyness. And actually a couple of comments have come in here, Nadia. Alan's talked Ooh. about the best advice comes from people that don't always offer their advice or don't give advice, which is, which is to your point around observations. Um, and uh, Anthony's talked about the fact that Richard Branson actually is quite shy and people would, would, would never have seen that. Um, yeah, I'm writing a book about shyness and I've been doing lots of research into shy people and there's some incredibly well-known shy people and you would not have a clue that they're shy. Um, I think a lot of people mask it in situations or they learn to kind of play a role. Um, I prefer to just be myself rather than playing a role but um, you have to you know, do, do what works for you. So I'd love shyness to be more... Um, rather than seen as a problem, or I've even had it described to me as a disability. It's not a disability, and we, we're not broken, um, it's just the way we are. So it would be good if people kind of understood it. Um, in the workplace, avoiding putting people on the spot <laughs> is a really helpful <laughs> suggestion. Um, I like to think about kind of gentle encouragement and baby steps. If you push people too hard too soon, um, it 
kind of it can backfire and you risk losing them if instead you give people a little bit more time um more time to to think and formulate their ideas a bit more time to maybe prepare not kind of it is not giving them special treatment it's just approaching things with a view that some people might want to think things through before they speak or before they um write something or come up with an idea you'll get happier people and better quality um, content and ideas um the written word using the written word shy people like writing um because we can think and we can formulate things and go back and change things and you'll get better quality um work when it's written down than if you put someone on the spot particularly if it's in front of people and you're kind of encouraging them to sort of speak up, go on, we haven't heard from you. Ah, that can be quite scary. Whereas if someone submits something in writing and you can read it out even on their behalf, that's a good way of doing it. Okay, being comfortable. Um, shyness um, and comfort <laughs> work well together. When you feel comfortable in a situation, you warm up and you feel like you can contribute. I'm not shy around my friends, the opposite. I'm not shy around my family. I'm completely comfortable with them. When I'm in a team of people, once I feel comfortable with them, um, I'm not shy at all. And that's the same for a lot of people. So giving um, your people time to warm up. If you have someone new in a team or in a new situation, just being aware that they may need time to become comfortable and to relax. Um, you can do things like having a buddy system in place or um, just allowing people a bit more time um, to get used to a new environment, a new team, a new situation. So for example, now that we're all moving to Zoom, I imagine that for shy people at first, it all seems a bit what's going on, it seems unusual, I'm not sure what to do, I feel awkward, they're all looking at me, there are cameras. <laughs> but if you allow people time to warm up and you understand that it's going to be like that for them, um, they'll relax. Um, asking questions. If you feel like someone who's shy is not speaking up, um, a good way to help them relax is to ask them what they need um, in a quiet way. So not in front of other people, but just ask them if they need a bit more support or a bit more training in a certain situation or if there's something that's worrying them. Um, if you find out what's at the root of um, their kind of anxieties or fears, you can do something um, to help them. But often we wouldn't even think about asking someone why um, you know, why they feel a certain way or what's going on for them. But the minute you do, and that's why I've put a cup of coffee there, in a quiet, calm way, one-to-one. -one, qu um, shy people like one-to-one -one conversations, not one-to-500 kind of awkward, embarrassing, self-conscious um, experiences. Right, let's come on to the next slide. We're going to talk about leveraging shy people's unique strengths. Um, I so wish this had happened to me <laughs> from a young age um, and at work. I felt like often people tried to change who I was and the way I was instead of looking at the kind of things I'm really good at, the kind of things that make me um, a bit of a ninja in certain situations. Um, when you look at shy people and their unique strengths, their preferences and skills, you make it easier for them to shine. We already talked about like listening skills and problem solving and empathising and deep connections, having ideas, planning, um, making difficult decisions, um, critical thinking shy people are really good at these things and so actually if you start to look for ways in which you can get people doing more of the things they're really good at then they're going to go from strength to strength um shy people are also really good at doing the actual work 
this is a bit controversial, um, than telling everyone what a great job they've done. <laughs> so that's definitely something to bear in mind. Um, I know that in organisations that I've worked, often there are people who are really good at raising their profile. Um, shy people won't raise their own profile. Um, they're too busy doing a good job, but they won't tell anybody about it. And um, what they may be really good at is shining a light and bigging up other people rather than having the spotlight on themselves. Um, so that's actually one of the reasons why we find a lot of um, shy people maybe go into podcasting because when you create a podcast, you're interviewing someone else, you're shining the light on them. Um, but you're listening to other people. So that's why shy people are often really good at, say, counselling and coaching, um, because it involves one-to-one -one interactions, listening, um, and focus on somebody else. Um, so essentially, I want you to be focusing on um, the things that shy people are good at and giving them the opportunity to shine. Okay, let's talk quiet space. Um, open plan offices, obviously nobody's in an office <laughs> at the moment, but I know that I'm in a very noisy house <laughs> and I struggle with too much distraction and noise and chatter. When you're shy, you need to have time and space to think. We have a lot of conversation and um, dialogue in our head. Um, a lot of it's kind of going on on a one-to-one -one basis in there. And we need some time and space to, um, I guess, analyse and process our thoughts. Then once we've done that, we can come back and share um, and discuss the things that we found out. So even in this time, even when we are um, working virtually, not all in the same place, giving shy people time to think about things and then come back to discuss um, is a, a helpful thing to do. We mentioned the size of meetings, um, whether that's virtual meetings or face-to-face. Um, -face. Large meetings don't work very well for shy people. So rather than letting their contributions go unheard, I like the idea of huddles where you have perhaps three, two or three people together um, having a catch up and um, you schedule those regularly. You'll get much more out of your shy people. You'll be able to hear what they think. And then you can always go back to a larger group and somebody can be a spokesperson for that huddle and communicate what they've discussed. Okay. I mentioned before that shy people don't feel comfortable shouting about their achievements. It's why we're probably pretty bad at doing our own PR. <laughs> I know I'm really good at doing PR for other people, just not for myself. Um, shy people will never be the ones to go around telling everyone how marvellous they are. They'll never CC everyone in um, and share a big achievement. But what we can do to help shy people is to be a champion for them. So support them in raising their profile. After all, um, the quality of the work that they've produced is probably really high. Um, so what we can do is things like encouraging them to contribute to an internal blog. Um, written word, if you create the opportunity for them and secure the opportunity, um, it feels easier for people to, to write a piece, say, um, than to have negotiated that opportunity in the first place. You could be gently encouraging people to put themselves forward, perhaps and thinking about comfort. How can you make it feel comfortable for them to do that? Um, Recognising their achievements, but in a quiet way. So do note that for me, the idea of going up on a stage and collecting a prize, I wouldn't do that. I would probably be hiding in the toilet. So um, you have to do it in a way that doesn't make people um, freak out. But I think when you do help shy people to shine and you, um, you've raised awareness of shy people and you've spoken up, 
on their behalf and said, look, we, we really encourage the quieter people amongst you to, to share the things that you've been working on. I think that's when more shy and quiet people will feel comfortable to speak up. Um, helping your shy people to have a success strategy. So coaching or mentoring or support of any kind is gonna help shy people to flourish. If you can work with them to set goals relating to building um, their, com I made this word up, I think, comfortability, I don't know if that's actually a word, um, in more challenging situations, then you're going to help them do better at their job. They'll do, do better for the organisation. Um, you can look at how to overcome the specific things that are holding them back. So whether it's that they hate pitching because um, they, they find it very stressful, but actually they're really good in a pitch because they've listened to the problem and they're really good at helping a client see that you would be a really trustworthy um, organisation to have on board. How can you work with their shyness to get their strengths, um, to bring their strengths to the fore? Um, if you don't have the expertise to do this or the time, then bring someone in who can help you. I know that personally, if someone had sat down with me and had this conversation, maybe 20 years ago, um, things would have been very different. Instead, I always felt like I was kind of fudging things and, and faking my way through situations rather than admitting that certain things were difficult for me and then putting a plan in place um, to move forward. The thing with shyness aha, is that it's about consistent action. Um, it's not enough to go on um, a one day like two hour course and just change your personality overnight. That's not gonna work. It's not a good idea. Instead you know if there's aspects of shyness that are holding people back um, you want to help them take consistent action. I always think about baby steps. Um, it's about building up. Like, if you were going to work out, you don't just run a marathon in a day or, like, start lifting Olympic-style weights um, in a day. You build up to it. And it's a bit like building your bravery muscles. So for me to, like, leap into maybe giving a TED Talk, even though I'd really like to... Um, it's probably not going to be a very good idea. I need to build up to it a bit at a time. And that's um, what you can help your shy people to do, is giving them the opportunity to take little steps forward um, each week or even each day um, to encourage them to push themselves a tiny bit. So soon enough that builds and they never get that kind of big freak out and um, it feels like something which is really doable. So I know that when I work with my clients that's what we do. Um, I support them regularly to push themselves a tiny bit at a time and that's how they get to see results. Okay so I've covered a lot and then you guys have shared stuff in your on the whiteboard as well. Um, so I'd like to invite you to ask me some questions if you like and given that this is about shyness um, you could write them in the chat <laughs> um, so you don't have to say them in front of everybody um, and we can read them out and um, yeah I'll, I'll hopefully be able to help you. Nadia can I check can you see the chat functionality? Can you oh, see the let me just get it back up again yeah I have to say, whilst people are thinking of their questions, I just want to say thank you. I'm so glad that we decided to do this, this webinar together. Um, I hope you do build up your bravery muscles because I want, I want to see you on that TED Talk. Um, having worked with you for many, many years, I know that you've got so many ideas and you're so passionate about this area because I think your passion comes from personal experience as well. Um, yeah, it does leaders on the call today or individuals who maybe are colleagues in a team and not leaders in a team have 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 learned some some steps here so what you talked about little steps uh, and thank you for sharing them with us um jane is talking there about authenticity being the key listening to a genuine voice 
that's inspiring and thanking you for that. Oh, thank you. Next ask yeah. question, what are the overlaps between shyness and introversion? Now, I know we talked about this, so actually, would you explain that? Because you had to explain that to me and it was fascinating. Yeah, I do have to explain that a lot. Um, so, I would say they're like cousins, shyness and introversion, and there's an overlap. Um, but not all shy people are introverts, although lots of them may be. Personally, I'm an extrovert, but I'm a shy extrovert, which means that for me, I draw energy from being around people. I want to socialise. When I have a problem, I want to tell loads of people about it. But my shyness keeps me in the background a little bit and stops me from doing certain things. Um, so, for example, um, I want to give a talk, but I... Um, I have like the self-doubt that comes up. I worry about things. I think deeply about stuff, um, like we discussed. Um, you can be um, an introvert who isn't shy. So there are a lot of introverts who they draw their energy from being alone. Being around people is exhausting for introverts and they need to go away, be by themselves and kind of reboot or um, re-energize. Um, but they may not be shy. They may be completely happy with being exactly how they are and very confident in, their, in themselves. Um, so you can see how it's about where introversion and extroversion is where you get your energy from. Um, and shyness is a kind of preference for um, taking a step back and observing and for you know, not being the, the loudest person in the room. Actually, Nadia, I'm going to talk about the retail. I mentioned that we discussed the other day as a diversity and inclusion issue around introversion and extroversion. So we were working with a very well-known retailer on their diversity and inclusion strategy. And some of their scores really hadn't moved over the years. And they've done a lot of work on gender groups, on profiling, on, on putting together more uh, gay-friendly policies, on introducing childcare, all sorts of things that you think might move the DNI needle, but it wasn't moving. And when we did the insight piece as part of our innovation project, what we found actually, the DNI area that was being overlooked was about introverts and extroverts. Those people in the organization that were extroverts were being listened to and were being included. And that happened at the board level where there were two or three people that surrounded the CEO, very extroverts, so their opinions were heard loudest and most. And that then was role model right white way down the organization. So if you were slightly more introverted, you weren't listened to in the organization, your point of view wasn't heard and therefore you didn't feel included. And once we highlighted this as part of their DNI strategy, it changed the way they viewed introversion and extroversion. They did a lot of work to try and address it and found a movement in their scores. Bronwyn's asked us some advice here actually about presenting skills. She does a lot of training for people in her organisation. Any tips for shyness with presenting skills? You've done a great presentation today. Any tips you can share? Yeah, um, I do. I'd say that um, before you before you get shy people into a room um, to do the standard kind of presentation skills, I think there's a piece of work that comes first. Um, it seems to me that most of the stuff we teach at that point is um, <clears throat> once people feel comfortable being in the room in the first place. I know that for me, when I've experienced that kind of training, um, when I was feeling particularly shy, most of it I just didn't absorb it because I was in a kind of fight, fight or freeze situation, just about like being in the room. So I think there's some work to be done first, I would say. Um, the thing that helps me when I'm about to give a talk, because I do a lot of speaking now, um, and but I've worked on it, you know, for a number of years. So it's not something that I um, just immediately was able to do. Um, it really helps me to think about my purpose. Um, if I think about the people I'm helping and the fact that if I don't do what I'm about to do, I'm not going to help them. You know, they won't get to hear what I have to say, not because I'm amazing and, you know, I'm the best person to share it, but because I feel like I can do something to help even one person, then um, 
that purpose is what kind of sees me through because it's bigger than me. Shy people respond really well to having a big sense of purpose, something that's not about us, um, because then we can shift our focus away from our fears and the way, like the, the sweaty feeling that we have. <laughs> it's, it's bigger than us. Okay, so I hope that helps, Bronwyn. Alan's asked a question here, around, which I think is, is very pertinent. So do you have any tips for reframing the very common corporate tendency to most valued people who walk the talk, i.e. they must be able to deliver on an idea rather than contribute to the formation of that idea? and then perhaps step away from the implementation because it's so public. Any thoughts on how we can value the contribution that shy people make and know they may not want to execute it publicly? Yeah, I think that that kind of culture comes from the top, doesn't it? And I think there's a, a culture change piece that needs to be done from the top level, which makes it clear that it's not just um, about the people that maybe sell the idea, um, it, it's a team effort and I think when that change like my like my quote, what you were expressing about um, the work that you had done um, it needs to come from that top level and then filter all the way through rather than expecting it to kind of change one person at a time um, I think that people walk rather than contributing okay so um, but within a team, I do think there's stuff that you can do to make it clear that everybody um, contributed. So for me, this reminds me of, you know, in a football match when um, some football teams only praise the goal scorers. So if you're a defender, it's like you're completely overlooked um, because you didn't score the goal. Whereas other teams understand that it's about passing and it's a team effort and the ball would never have got to the um, striker if it hadn't have been for the people at the back. So within a team, it's how you reward um, success and the way you talk about team roles. But I do think there's two things there, the team and also top level. Um, but yeah, it's a common problem, like you say, Alan, that people... Um, it, you know, people who are shy will tend to do a lot of the work and then just go, there you go, and then stand back um, and just sort of avoid getting um, involved <laughs> at that point. Well, we've been very involved today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw our, our session to a close and um, echo a number of comments on there, Nadia, where people have, have thanked you for being so brave and, and sharing your personal story. I know that having worked with you both in an innovation agency, um, and then work together the last couple of years, how important diversity and inclusion is for innovation and how particularly when we're all working remotely, um, making sure that you're thinking of the silent potential in the organisation is more important than ever. Um, if anyone's interested in hearing more, you can see contact details for Nadia there and myself. Um, and if you want to hear more around webcasts that we're doing, webinars and hints and tips about how to work more effectively at the moment, then please do join our virtual WhatsApp delivery group. You'll see there's a QR code there on the screen. Now I've learned from this new technology, new tips. I always thought you needed some sort of app. You literally just turn the photograph, uh, the camera on your phone, point it towards the screen now, and you should be able to join our virtual group. Nadia, thanks again so much for your contribution today. I look forward to reading your book when it comes out. Um, and we will make sure that we send a recording of this to everyone who attended today, as well as the whiteboard. And Joe is going to help me make sure that we record the web webinar chat so we can keep a record of that as well. So have a great day, everyone. Stay safe. And thank you so much for your time and your attention. And once again, thank you very much, Nadia, for sharing your story. Oh, thank you.